Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video we'll talk about hybridization, bond angles, and bond geometry as it'll show up in your organic chemistry course. You can find my entire Orgo Basics series by visiting my website LeiaForSci.com slash Orgo Basics. To truly appreciate and understand hybridization, you must know your orbitals and your electron configuration. If you're not confident with these topics, go back to my Intro to Orgo video series, which you can find on my website at layerforsci.com slash organic chemistry. The idea of hybridization is taking orbitals that want to bond, orbitals that are not capable of bonding, and combining them into some hybrid that is able to create a bond with another atom. Let's look at carbon to understand this in more detail. The electron configuration for carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. 1s2 is the kernel or the internal shell, which we don't look at. It's only the valence shell that participates in bonding, and in this case we have two electrons in the 2s orbital and two electrons in the 2p orbital. If we draw this out in terms of where the electrons are located and their energy, we have 1s orbital and 3p orbitals. The s orbital is full with two electrons. The p orbital has just two electrons between the three suborbitals. In order to create a covalent bond, another atom will have to take one of its electrons and combine it with a free or an available electron. If we look at carbon the way it is, we can have an electron bind with this p electron, another electron bind here, giving me a total of two bonds. But we know that carbon, as the core atom in organic chemistry, is capable of forming four bonds, but how is that possible? In order to form the four bonds, we have to somehow combine the orbitals and the electrons from S and P and create a hybrid as follows. Bonding requires energy, and that slight bit of energy will take the lower energy S orbital and raise it up to become equivalent with the p orbital. The electrons are now considered to be degenerate, meaning of the same energy. And if we have degenerate electrons, they will prefer to be spread out over the individual orbitals instead of being doubled up if there's still an empty orbital available. As I explain in my orbital video, the idea is, would you share a room with your sister if you had an empty room in the house? No. I personally would want to have my own room if I didn't have to share with a sibling. What we have now is some mix of four suborbitals containing a total of four equivalent electrons. To create this combination, we had to combine 1s and 3p orbitals, and the designation for this would be s times p times p times p. In math, when you have something times itself, it becomes squared times itself again becomes cubed, and so the hybrid orbital is sp cubed or simply sp3. An example of this would be the molecule methane. We have carbon single bound to four hydrogen atoms. When carbon is in sp3 hybridization, we have four equivalent sp3 hybrid orbitals, and each hydrogen atom is capable of binding to one of them. If you looked at methane and had to figure out the hybridization, here's the trick. Count your bonds or groups, in this case we have 1, 2, 3, 4, draw 4 lines, and then start counting from S to P, knowing that there's only 1S, 3P, anything beyond that becomes D. If we fill it in, we have S, and then we follow to P, P, and P, and that gives me SP3. In order for 4 groups to be equidistant from each other, we get a bond angle, or theta, of 109.5 degrees. This is a number that you do have to memorize. sp3 hybridization is typically 109.5. Sometimes the number will be slightly greater or slightly less if there's a difference in polarity between the atoms that bind to that central atom, but that's the number to memorize. You can have atoms that are not carbon that will also undergo hybridization, but it's a little bit harder to see. For example, if we look at nitrogen in NH3, nitrogen is bound to three hydrogen atoms. It also has two valence electrons. If we look at the electron configuration for nitrogen, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. 1s2 is the kernel, we get rid of it. 2s2 and 2p3 are the valence electrons. We have the 2s with two electrons and 2p with three electrons. 
As it is, it looks like the nitrogen is capable of binding to the hydrogens without any change or hybridization. But when you have lone pairs of electrons in a molecule, almost think of it as the electron is bound to the other electron and therefore it has to be at the same or very similar energy level to the regular bonds. So in this case, we'll still elevate the S to the level of P and have the combined hybrid orbital of sp3. The way you want to envision this is as follows. Remember for carbon we drew our shape like this showing four equal units with a tetrahedral geometry. We'll bind our three hydrogens because we know that's there. For the fourth one, instead of putting a lone pair, just imagine as if the electron is bound to the other electron. It's not really, they're in there together, but this is how you can understand that even though we have only three bonds, it's still a tetrahedral electronic configuration. The reason I stress electronic is there are two ways to look at this shape. For the electronic geometry, we're looking at where the electrons are located, we're not looking at the atoms that they're bound to. So for example, nitrogen bound to hydrogen, we're only looking at the bond, which is an electron on electron, just like with a lone pair, we have the electron and electron. The electronic geometry, which comes from the sp3 hybridization, has four different groups, giving me a tetrahedron as the noun or tetrahedral as the verb, same thing. But if we look at just the molecule, meaning only the visible atoms, we have nitrogen bound in a weird pyramid to the three hydrogen atoms. Ignoring the effect of the electrons, the molecular geometry is actually trigonal pyramidal. The trigonal comes from the three atoms, which is a triangle shape, but the pyramid tells us that it's bent slightly downward from the nitrogen and forms a pyramid rather than being flat. This is why you should know both the electronic and the molecular. Even though we have the triangle shape from the hydrogens, that lone pair of electrons being more negative compared to the atoms that are sharing is going to repel the bonds downward, forcing them into a pyramid rather than allowing them to be flat as we'll see later with sp2 hybridization. Let's look at one more example of an sp3 atom. This time we'll look at water where oxygen is bound to two hydrogen atoms, but also has two lone pairs. We'll draw the oxygen in a tetrahedral shape, given that it's sp3 and has four equal groups surrounding it. Two of the groups will get a hydrogen atom, where we have the bonds, and two of the groups will get an electron bound to an electron as our way of understanding how it's tetrahedral. Notice that even though we have the two atoms, we still have that overall sp3 hybridization. Since this is sp3, the electronic geometry is still tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry, which only looks at the molecule visible and not the electron surrounding it, is going to be simply bent, because the oxygen has two hydrogen atoms and they're bent slightly towards each other. The bond angles are still approximately 109.5, but because the lone pairs are considered to be slightly more negative, they're going to push on the hydrogen atoms, forcing them closer together. If this was an exam and you didn't memorize the exact number, you can write slightly less than 109.5 for the angle between the hydrogen atoms and slightly greater than 109.5 for the angle between the two lone pairs. I think the angle is somewhere near 105, but unless you're told to memorize it, don't worry about it. But be sure to join me in the next video where I take you through sp2 and sp hybridization and then show you a fun trick for how to quickly recognize the hybridization on wacky molecules, including drugs that professors love to put on exams. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for resources and information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, then I have a deal for you. A free copy of my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry. Use the link below or visit orgosecrets.com to grab your free copy. After downloading your free copy of my ebook, you'll begin receiving my exclusive email updates with cheat sheets, reaction guides, study tips, and so much more. You'll also be the first to know when I have a new video or live review coming up. If you enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up and share it with your organic chemistry friends and classmates. I will be uploading many videos over the course of the semester, so if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, do so right now to be sure that you don't miss out.